on you guys it's your huggable hipster here and welcome to today's podcast where we have a very special guest in our midst now y'all know that i finished playing the game homecoming and we also played silent hill 2 and 3 silent hill homecoming is one of those titles that will forever be one of my favorites and what better way to conclude a silent hill game than to interview one of the people who worked on it. Joining me today is one of the developers, actually one of the associate designers that worked on the game Silent Hill Homecoming. Thank you so much for joining me today. Hi, Ariel. Thank you. Thank you for having me. Now, I, I was kind of uh, nervous about messaging you at first. I will sell you and I will tell my audience because I was afraid of that someone was, that you were actually in particular were going to be like, mm, I don't do interviews or why is this random person messaging me? <laughs> Oh, no, it's actually the opposite. Nobody ever messaged me. And um, to your point, I think we mentioned earlier before the podcast that Silent Hill is, I think, really underappreciated. People don't talk about it enough. Uh, so it's just nice to get a little something out there and, and talk about something I worked on with people who hopefully appreciate it. Yeah, and I, I know that there are a lot of people on this channel who really enjoy uh, Silent Hill, especially Homecoming. And I do have to say, it's one of the more gruesome Silent Hill titles I've seen, which I appreciate <laughs> myself because I, I'm all about well-timed <laughs> gore and blood. <laughs> Glad to hear that. Excellent. So the first question I do have for you is kind of that question that I know that any every interviewer likes to ask. So I do have to say, what got you into game development? Sure. Um, quick, this is a quick two-parter. The first is, uh, when I was a little kid, my mom used to play Atari 2600 video games. So one of my earliest memories is like, walking down a hallway when I was very young and going into a room and seeing her playing Frogger or something on the 2600. Uh, oh, nice. So, for, yeah, right. <laughs> it's, uh, so uh, the seed was planted early, and then um, I was just, I guess, fortunate enough to have access to computers when I was growing up. Um, some small amount of materials to, to learn it. And that was back in the day, so things were very different. You couldn't just go on YouTube and get tutorials. You just kind of learned how to do it wherever you did it. Um, but I loved games when I was a kid. Games were just the coolest thing ever. And uh, as gaming has changed, uh, I got more and more into it. I learned more and more different types of programming. And then out of high school, I could start getting jobs in programming. <laughs> so it, my, oh, wow. my career uh, was all about just finding stuff where I could get hired and make some money and make a difference make some cool games so that's really really cool i like that yeah, yeah. see i've worked a bunch of random jobs though so like in between <laughs> in between getting action game dev jobs yeah i totally feel like it's kind of like what people say of paying your dues kind of thing <laughs> right exactly like starting a qa or seeing an associate producer role yeah, whatever whatever you get in however you get in that's the way they get in so Right. So I do have to say, in, um, in addition to that, as a game developer, what were the things that you were responsible as far as Silent Hill Homecoming is concerned? Oh, okay. So um, I'm just going to like talk about some of the things I listed on the LinkedIn page here. Um, so Silent Hill was, when I came on, already in development. Uh, I was working on a different project at the time, and they said, we just need people to get this game out the door. Like, There's a lot of stuff to do, and not a lot of it's wired up. Uh, so I just come off of a different project where I did pretty much the same thing I did on Silent Hill, which is level design, scripting, uh, just general like we call it crossing crossing all the wires, right? Putting them all putting them all plugged in. Oh, so you uh, worked on the first game too? No, I wish. God. Oh, okay. Okay, because one of you. No, no. Okay, because I was about to say I was like, wait a second, you worked on the first no. game? <laughs> oh God, I wish. Um, so uh, what I did mostly was scripting, which is like. When you have all the things that need to happen in the game, it's like, where do the enemies spawn? Uh, where are the physics things that happen in the level? Uh, what are the events? What triggers a thing? Like when Alex walks into a certain area, what does the music sound like? Uh, or like, does the atmosphere get darker? Do the lights go lower? Does like, does this light start flickering? Um, so wiring things up to the game. Things like puzzles also. So like the player walks up and pushes X on a puzzle. You know, is the player going to turn and face the puzzle like what happens to the camera what happens to your inventory if you're just playing it like do you put your weapon away um so you have to tell basically telling the game what the player wants to do and then telling the player what it's doing um uh, so I, you, I, you see guys there's a lot more in gaming than just actually playing it for those of you who don't think there's much that's involved <laughs> um, what's funny is actually i didn't play much of the game when i was working on it until near the end of the game 
So we had a specific time for the game. I said, okay, everybody, hey, the game's kind of mostly done. You should play test it and see how far you can get. Uh, so I did um, scripting and design for Alex's house, uh, Alex's house, hell mode, and uh, the lair, which is the last level of the game. Ah, okay. Uh, um, and I did like a little bit of scripting. I did a little bit of scripting while I, um, you know, like variously, if people needed help on a different level. There was a sewer level uh, after you escaped from the hospital. Uh, I had to do a lot of scripting for some tricky crap on that. Uh, I, yeah, I, that was definitely yeah. an interesting part of the game. <laughs> yeah, um, I'll tell you. I'll tell you more about a thing in the sewers later that was like, my personal Silent Hill nightmare. Um, <laughs> but uh, so, yeah, really. Um, so I edited and rewrote a lot. Of, I wouldn't say a lot of the dialogue, but some of the dialogue as we went through the collaborative process with the writers. Um, I was a big fan of, I think, John Miller was one of the writers on the game, and he loved that the number 206 appears everywhere. So we kept trying to find little ways to, like, kind of kind of make innocent dialogue lines that referred to things in the game that were very serious. Um, I think one of them is, if you go into the bathroom, I'm, I'm actually proud of this one, if you go into the bathroom and look at the bathtub in his house normally, Alex will say something like, oh, I always hated taking baths. Um, something about the tub just bothered me. And if I mean, you played through the game on your stream, uh, one of the endings is Alex gets drowned in the bathtub by his dad. So <laughs> it's, exactly. it's a, little, yeah. <laughs> a little bit of ironic <laughs> foreshadow. And we love throwing stuff in like that, where you're like, okay, just a little line in there that, that hints to people that something's wrong. Oh, like, why did you say that? It's weird. Oh, because it calls back to this other thing. Yeah, exactly. And also, yeah. like, the ending of where he's in room 206 yeah. of the hospital. And yeah. I was like, wait a second. This is referring back to, like, the hell version of his house. Yes. Just, I see what you're doing. <laughs> yeah. And uh, I think if you notice in the game, a lot of the clocks are stopped at 206. Yes. Um, and there's it's just all, it's everywhere. It's really interesting because that's one thing that I think Silent Hill does really well is making things very uh, just much of a constant within their universe. And if mm -hmm. they have one thing that kind of freaks people out, they do it as a constant, not to yeah. annoy the person, but as a kind of like, hey, I'm still here, but I'm still going to bug you kind of way. Yeah, a little bit. It really does. Um, so that's simultaneously like more planned and less planned than you might think. Like, there are some people out there who are very sticklers for the rules, saying, oh my god, here's the Bible for Silent Hill, all the clocks say 206, they have to be like this. And then they'll go through the game and they'll, like, find all the clocks and make sure they all say 206 or, or whatever. Um, but also there's no, like, there's no, quote, Bible, necessarily. There's no, like, one book you can turn to and say, oh, look, here the writers wrote this. Um, it, Imagine it, it, that one developer, though, that puts in 106 and they're just, like, <laughs> beating to the punch. <laughs> <laughs> right, right, exactly. <laughs> That's how I get to be an associate. Uh, no, I'm just kidding. I wasn't. <laughs> um, so let's see. So I'm going to just quick some of the other stuff I did here. So uh, with the dynamic lighting, that was a real problem. People just put lights everywhere in the game. It made it oh, really gosh. slow. So we had to really adjust it to make it smarter. Um, uh, probably one of the worst lighting areas in the entire game was the very end, right before you fight the last boss. Uh, when I got in there, just everything was super like overlit. There were way too many lights. I had to go trim them oh, all. Oh wow! Yeah, it, it's all about making it more moody, but also making frame rate. Um, I did a lot of the audio work. That was another, one. Um, just a ton of it, putting all the ambient sounds like winds, water drips in the basement, things like that. Also, can I say thank you for that? Because any time that I would be in the gameplay, I would yeah. always comment, and people can uh, vouch for me on this, yeah. and, and how and, like ambiotic like the drip sounds were in the sewers, and how just creepy everything felt. Because oh, yeah. every time that I went through a certain section, the sounds were so well placed that it actually made me feel like genuinely freaked out. <laughs> That's awesome. I'm glad to hear that. We had a really good audience. Um, they were outstanding. So. Uh, horror horror games is i want to say like 90 percent audio um, oh absolutely if you, if you don't believe me try watching any scary movie or playing any scary game so, so the the um the next question i do have is something that was a bit of a, a thing that i was wondering for a while from a lot of developers is why silent hill what made you want to work on uh, on and with the silent hill team <laughs> so this is funny because it was actually a bit of a chance um I was working on a project before this at a different studio. So uh, Shiny Entertainment. Heard of them? Um, uh, yes, I believe so. Yeah, they're gone now. So, uh, But their last game as Shiny Entertainment was the Golden Compass game for the movie. And that was my first ever like real 
gameplay job. Um, so I started working there, and this guy who used to sit at the desk next to me, uh, Nick Pard, he was one of the senior level designers who was in charge of do that game. He heard me listening to some, I don't know, brutal death metal. I forget what it was. Uh, but he heard, it, heard me listening to it over my headphones, and he came over, and he's like, oh, dude, do you like metal? I'm like, oh, yeah, I love it. We spent about uh, 30 minutes talking about you know, various kinds of, like, metal genres and concerts we'd seen and whatnot. And at the end of it, it was, hey, man, do you want to come work on Silent Hill? Like, <laughs> That's awesome. <laughs> yes, of course I do. This is this is my dream right here. Why are you asking? He's like, oh, well, because I work on um, this other company that, and, you know, Shiny was going to merge with them in a couple of months. So I work at this other company. Uh, and, you know, the team's going to move over there. So if you want a spot on that team, I'll board for you. You can work on Silent Hill. And I was I like jumping for joy. Oh. Internally, I was like screaming, but outside, I was trying to play cool. I'm like, oh yeah, oh, that would be amazing. I'd love to. Work That's so absolutely they, uh, amazing. Yeah, so he short, he shortlisted me over there. He just transferred. They literally just transferred my contract over there. That's like, the next wow. week. <laughs> they were like, oh hey, <laughs> by the way, you work for these guys now. Come on over. Yeah, see you later. Bye. So, that is like a dream come true. It's just like yeah. imagine waking up one day and just being like, oh okay, that was easy. <laughs> yeah, exactly. exactly. <laughs> So now I listen to metal at every job, and hopefully that uh, you know somebody from Konami or something walk over and say, "Oh, you like metal? You want to come work on our new Silent Hill game?" No, imagine if that were Norman Reedus walking over to you, just being like, "Hello, do you want to work on the new Death Stranding?" <laughs> I don't know. I you know it's funny. I didn't play Death Stranding. Uh, I watched a bunch of people play it on streaming and stuff. Like okay, I heard. Yeah, I have. I haven't watched it either. I'm, I'm waiting till I get a PS4 in order to play it because I've heard the graphics yeah. and just everything is just phenomenal. Oh, yeah, it looks really nice. Yeah. So I do have to ask, what is something um, that you thought should have been in the Silent Hill Homecoming game, or any Silent Hill game for that matter? Because I, I know a lot mm. of people were like, oh, either this, the monsters are too easy, or there should have been this more in the game. What do you think? Well, okay. I'm not going to talk about monsters, because it's, it's, I think, a balance issue, maybe. It's like, you know, they should have been monsters should have been easier, harder, whatever. That's just too neat, right? Like, you should be able to I don't know, put it on easy mode or whatever, and just one shot everything, or put it on hard mode. And um, I think that survival mechanics are the shiznit for horror games. No, I'm not even kidding. Like, um, and my it's, people are talking about like, oh, we hate the flashlight in in Homecoming, and we had a lot of problems getting the flashlight right. Uh, it used to be this charging mechanic where the the timer would run out and you had to mash the button to recharge your flashlight oh, periodically oh, and it was the god. most infuriating mechanic because they'd be like oh god monsters are hunting me i gotta stand in the corner and jam the x button for like 10 seconds <laughs> like oh, no, no it's not gonna happen so they they took that out i'm super glad but i'm glad too that would have been a nightmare <laughs> yeah it was really bad um and it was weak and you know like we were just not so what we did was um they took it all out and they just made it the stuff that we have now. But I think survival would be the like, ideal. Like um, scavenging ruined houses to find medical supplies. Like maybe there's a section in the game that you can't beat unless you have uh, you know, a certain amount of healing or medical supplies. Or maybe it's like a, a roguelike sort of thing where you start in the center of town and you have to like go out to different locations and discover all these things and come back, but that takes maybe supplies, right? right. So um, so Homecoming, I think, is very linear. So if, if anything, I would say like open-world type survival mechanics, um, but the game still needs to be a linear story. Thing. It, can't, it can't be like, you know, you've got side quests and stuff. Uh, like, oh gosh, imagine I, side quests and Silent Hill yeah, Homecoming. Yeah, I know, it doesn't, it doesn't really work. <laughs> I, you could maybe make it work if you have really good writers and, and it weren't you know, just like a Assassin's Creed, you collect all the feathers or collect yeah, all the photographs. Like, I mean, I guess you could make that a side quest, but like, I think it's better organic. It's it called out. So it's that's it's I, interesting I, I, that you bring up the flashlight mechanic because it's something I always say in a lot of my playthroughs of where I just hate a lot of the flashlights that they yeah. have. And the, and the flashlight during the beginning of the uh, game Homecoming, absolutely brilliant. It was bright. It was well lit. Once yeah. it got to the sewer, I felt like Alex was like, oh, crap, I need new batteries. Like, you know, yeah. it started to die <laughs> up a little bit. But once it <laughs> right. got to the point of where you were battling some of the bosses, I felt like the flashlight mechanic was not even useful at all whatsoever. No, that's you, just my opinion no you could just you should they should have just turned it off 
Um, but I, I think I think the flashlight could be very useful. Um, if you haven't played Fatal Frame, I think Fatal Frame is very fun in that it uses a lot of like the player's view as the player when you're looking for kind of a camera to oh, capture very ghosts and things like that. So um, I think something like that with like, where maybe looking at something with the flashlight makes it miss you. There has to be a reason for the player to use the flashlight, right? You can't proceed. Yeah, exactly. So you can be looking for you know, clues or whatever to solve your current puzzle. Right, so, or like something where they had in Silent Hill 2 where you had to like directly like shine your light on something for it yeah. to like trigger another event. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. Like it has to be lit. You have to dig it up or something like that. Yeah. So. Yeah. Yeah. So uh, my my next question for you, and uh, you know, uh, I, mm -hmm. this could go of either way, but like as a game developer who worked on the games back in two thousand eight, what's it like to see the progression of gaming in terms of AI development and graphic work? Um, so a AI, I want to say it, it like it hasn't changed all that much. Um, we have what we have a lot more in games now is the ability to render a lot more crap, right? Like way more. Uh, individual guys moving around way more frames when i mean I, just every everything is better right like everything looks good the fundamental level design and scripting stuff has not really changed all that much like if you're gonna go i mean i do different stuff now but if you're gonna go back and like be a scripter or be a level designer in a game um the previous job on silent hill i was just placing triggers for the to spawn i was placing areas for Alex to walk into and interact with puzzles or placing lights, placing uh, audio events or things. Um, once you've learned how to do that in one type of engine, you can go do it in many other engines. You just need to learn how to, to do it. In the engine. Oh, so interesting. If I were going to go do it in Unity now, um, a lot of it is much cleaner, much smarter, much uh, simpler to implement than it was back in the day. Because uh, back in the day, so on Silent Hill, it was built with its own engine. Um, for the company that they had used in a lot of different games. And I think they went on to continue using that engine in other games as well that that company used. Um, That's actually pretty interesting. Yeah, the fact so, that you can, if you, if you know one language, you can apply it just across the board. That's really cool. Yeah, it, it, it does help. Um, right now, I mean, everything's pretty much unreal right now. So it, there are studios that still have their own house stuff. A lot of them are big AAA studios. Um, there are various reasons. It depends on where you want to. Um, the weird thing is, I think you mentioned AI development. Uh, AI pretty much has what they call a nav mesh, which is like uh, where the player can walk on the floor or where the enemies can walk on the floor. And those have various features. Then there's uh, there's pathing things, so how they get to you. So like you know, Silent Hill, how does the dog know to go in between the gravestone? Where can it jump on you? Um, some of that's coded individually, but um, and I'm sure there are packages out there to make it smarter. But if you went to go develop the same game today, I think it would be fundamentally very similar. So AI development has not gotten that much better. Um, when you see stuff like squad tactics or whatever in games, there's usually some AI designer who went and like coded that from scratch or whatever. Wow. <laughs> or whatever. Yeah, they don't, they don't have a lot of like, uh, packages you could just go buy that and just say oh here's the AI package or, or Unity like it's got some AI built in it's nav mesh uh, characters but if you want to do the more complicated stuff you kind of have to write it all yourself still damn so that's it, crazy though yeah yeah so it really it really hasn't changed too much the tools and things have gotten a lot you still have you still have to code all of it yourself I'd say Damn, that's crazy. They should have like yeah. a respect your game developer day. Oh my gosh. <laughs> there's so Honestly. there's so much. There's so much to do. Uh, but I do have to ask, uh, branching from mm. that question in regards to Silent Hill, what is mm. your what or actually I should say, what was your favorite part of Silent Hill Homecoming, whether it be the developmental process or playing the game or seeing people play it? So I think I think my absolute favorite is a mission that had very little combat in it, which is um, the descent. And I think it was, what did we say in the game? We were like, it's like 10 and a half minutes of you just terrifyingly, like, I don't want to go down this hole in the ground into hell, but I have to. <laughs> <laughs> um, and it's a little bit of, it, it's a little bit of like platforming. Um, I think there was a, 
think it was Portal 2 when you have to go into the underground area. I, th- I played Portal 2 after I played Silent Hill. Coming. Oh, gosh. <laughs> um, and, and I remember there's a part in Portal 2 where you have to go down into the underground, and I was getting flashbacks. This is just like in Silent Hill where we had to do the descent and go down into the hell area. Mm. Yeah, I remember that part. That part was really interesting to play. I It vaguely yeah. reminded me of the, what was it, video games that do that looping mechanism. Oh, yeah, where you're like, you go down and then you have, it stops you and you have to go back and do another thing again. Yeah, uh, that's, yeah. Um, we could have put more of that in Silent Hill. Yeah, I'm, I'm kind of glad you didn't. <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah I'll be Give me some retroactive ideas here. No, yeah. because the thing is, is that with Silent Hill, I feel a lot of the time what people either expect something that's really, really terrifying or just something that continues on forever. Kind of like what happened with James in Silent mm-hmm. Hill 2, where he yes. was in the uh, the jail cells and yep. each part kept looping. And I'm just like, what yeah, was that's... here before? <laughs> You're like, wait a minute. Yeah, but I think that's the best part about Silent Hill is, um, so you said the favorite part of the game, Homecoming, and I think that's the, like I said, the set, but the, the home, Silent Hill itself as the series, I like that they do things that other games don't do in terms of narrative, in terms of a little bit gameplay, and that it has a weird sort of dreamlike quality to it. Yeah, it really that, does. That messing with you like that, with those loops and things, um, the little tricks, right? Or or the, the foreshadowing. You'll see something in like level nine and you're like, oh, it's just thing level two. It all ties together. Or like, or does it have a connection? You're not sure because it's not explicit, right? And I think that partial information makes Silent Hill scarier above just the jump scares and the gore and the cool, creepy nurse fetish designs and whatnot. <laughs> Yeah, and it's interesting because I, I do have to admit, as someone who did not play the games first and saw the movies first, I I just I yeah I I understand why you're laughing completely. I, it's one of those things of where I was in college and I saw yeah. the the first movie and I was like, oh, this is so cool. Then I looked yeah. it up and I saw it was um, a game first, and then I started mm-hmm. playing the games and I was like, what have the producers of this movie done? Yeah, because They're... every every single time and now because. Whenever you brought in, uh, you were mentioning those kinds of mechanics, they don't put that into the movie at all. The movies are great on their own terms, but whenever you're really talking like the origins of Silent Hill, I feel like the games are just, they, they explain everything for themselves. Yeah. Um, one of the things that we actually ripped off, I say ripped it was inspired the game, was uh, they have that transition scene where it transitions from the real state to the hell state. Yes, I, I call it hell state. I don't know what I call it, but um, call it the hell state trenches. So when you go from real to hell in the movie, there's an effect where reality kind of turns into this like wrap almost. It's like a, yes. like a final wrap for reality, and then as it reality peels away in little tiny chunks, so they float upwards, and it reveals the uh, the nasty, disgusting textures behind. Yeah, I love that part. Whenever I did that. So that effect, I think, was just in the movie, and we told our developers, we're like, hey, uh, can we get this in the game? Like, this is really cool. We like it. So there was actually an effect that you could play at almost any point in the game where um, it would freeze the freeze the scene, and take all the geometry, and duplicate it into that rendered chunks, and then cut it up into little slices, and then make those slices fly up. So if you if you wanted to do a hell state transition, you could like, if you set it up the right way, you could do it almost anywhere in the game. That's actually pretty gnarly. I like that. Yeah, it was really cool. Uh, so yeah, that's really cool. So the um, speaking of the whenever we uh, you know talking about like each Silent Hill game because I feel like it's not just mm. our conversation. Is it just oh, limited to Silent Hill Homecoming anymore? It's the entire mm-hmm. series. What is your mm-hmm. favorite Silent Hill title and why? Um, so my very favorite one, and I get a lot of flashes because everybody says two is actually the first one, um, because that was the first Silent Hill I played, and uh, I think people say your favorite games are all tied up into your memories of playing the first time, and I really agree with that. So and mine was Silent Hill one, because I had it, and I remember I think the very first time I stayed up all night playing it, and it 
was, I don't want to say five in the morning or five thirty in the morning. And my dad was getting up to go to work and he saw me sitting there huddled underneath a blanket, having literally just completed silent Hill, like five minutes before he got up. And it's like, it's crazy. Why do you, you, why do you look so pale and scared? <laughs> <laughs> It's like, man, dad, I just played this game. I, I don't know. That's crazy. That's, really... that's... Oh. Honestly, that's how I feel about Silent Hill 2, because that was the first Silent Hill game I ever played. And just Excellent. seeing the uh, the psychology behind it, because I, I remember a previous discussion we had, like, um, I told you that uh, my major that I did in college is psychology. And just seeing the way that it unfolded before me and seeing like the character development, seeing how, you know, disassociative identity disorder really plays a big part in Silent Hill because you're going from one world to another and the characters kind of disassociate for a little bit. They're kind of like, oh, okay, I, I was here, but I don't remember anything much from any other previous time. So seeing all of that and playing through that entire game and seeing like the character Mary and Maria and how those yeah. two are just so closely woven together yeah. and seeing the pyramid head like seeing the pyramid head for the first time not yeah. in the movie made me respect the character so much more yeah that's that's true um i just pretend like the movie exists in a completely different universe than the game. <laughs> i, I it, it's it's an homage it's inspired by the characters it's a different refactoring of it but i don't i don't think it's it ties into the game itself. There are some things the movie did very right. I think they got the the gore and the brutality of it, and and, and the cultishness of Silent Hill, um, right? And and they got all the elements right, but the story was so convoluted. It was because uh, I saw different pieces from Homecoming that were completely in the second movie, Revelations, but oh, there were like different. <laughs> there were pieces from like Silent Hill one and two that were yeah. combined, and then they got Dahlia completely messed up, and I was just like, "What are you doing?" <laughs> yeah, I don't, I don't get. I I didn't even see Revelations because I heard it was super bad. It has like a five percent rating on Rotten Tomatoes. It's it's. it's I'm just gonna tell you right now they used the character the 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 needler and they turned it into like a mannequin spider Ugh, that's yeah uh, okay so somebody saw somebody saw the scarlet fight and they're like oh creepy dolls that are like spiders oh hey we should make those enemies in the game yep they basically combined the needler in that character together and they just made it chase like the main characters but they did get uh heather's character from silent hill 3 on point yeah, I heard. I heard she was in it actually, which was almost the only reason I watched it. Is because I'm like, oh, I want to see. Her. Yeah, and, and then they had what was it? Um, oh, I'm forgetting the the character's name, but the son of the um, the cult leader. Um, in three. In yeah, three? in the game. Yeah, oh, I don't. Oh, I'm trying to remember his name, but they portrayed him as like the boyfriend of the character in the movie of Heather, and I'm just like, what are you doing? Oh, that's weird. Because I guess Hollywood <laughs> thinks there has to be a love interest, and though it's people getting ripped apart and stuff, mutilated. Eh. Exactly, but. and they just made it into like this really weird part that the character was in, and I was just like, this is not how the character is portrayed at all. He's a, a creepy guy, not this like love fest. Okay. Oh no! Oh no! <laughs> see, I'm glad I didn't see it now. Yeah, it's it, it, now that I mean, like playing the games, it's a total cringe fest. I'm gonna be honest. <laughs> oh no! Well, yeah. so it's funny. So I mentioned one, and it, it is a little cringe fest if you go back and you see that polygons are really bad. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, <laughs> really low. Like um, the gameplay. Oh, the controls are just atrocious. Like oh god, I think, don't even I think, get me started on the gameplay. Yeah, play. <laughs> it's 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 really difficult. Um, the camera angles. And my my audience well, knows I can play about the camera angles constantly. In okay, two so and three. Here, so hold on. So here is, is this. I was this is secret designer lore. This was the biggest argument in Silent Hill Homecoming between all of the level designers and the the main producers. Was that we we wanted the Dutch angles. We wanted the crazy angles. That was all the designers were like. Man, I just want to make a fixed camera, and I want to have the angle pointing over here, and I want it so when Alex comes into the attic that you can't see anything, and then as soon as he walks past this point, the camera swings around, and you see this monster right there lurking, waiting to kill him. And Bear was like, no, you can't do that. We have to leave free cam in. Like, the game is free cam. It'll confuse people. And you know, and the designers are like, oh, what if we did free cam everywhere, but here you have a special camera angle, and then, like, just for this one section, or, like, just this one, you do the angle, or you know, or like, what if here it's like the camera's in the sewer, like something watching 
people will be like, oh yeah, let's do that. And then, you know, the producers will be like, nope, can't do it. No fixed camera angles. It has to be dynamic camera. So they eventually won out. I think there were some some camera angles where the camera was, you know, put on a put on a, a fixed spot and then swiveled around to rotate and track the player. But yeah, we wow. didn't. They wouldn't. They wouldn't <laughs> let us do the Dutch angles. They had to be like extremely. I don't remember whether any of it made it in the final game, but they had to be extremely approved. Interesting. Uh, See, there's so many yeah. so many layers that goes into that. That's unreal. Honestly, yeah. no pun intended. <laughs> no, all no, right. That was one of the few top down um, dictates for level designers from. Uh, the upper management was like you can't do fixed camera angles because they said that people complain too much about the earlier silent Hill games and, and they made everybody play through all of the silent Hill games. They, they made us like the senior designers and stuff they made them play through and they said it was awesome for the junior designers but we did it imagine had... having a job where you had to play games <laughs> like oh no oh no i have to yeah. play all the silent hill games in order yeah. to do this job right <laughs> it was a brutal slog though i remember uh, nobody was happy I think we were all like, oh, three, three, three. And then it was like, okay, this is new. It's not. <laughs> yeah, I, I heard that people really like four. And I'm looking at some of the the, uh, the work for four. And I'm just like, this doesn't even look like yeah. Sun Hill. This looks like what Resident Evil 6 is going to be. <laughs> so it wasn't. It wasn't. Originally, it was going to be some other game. And they just, they played it. And they said, oh, you know, this reminds me of Sun Hill. Oh, so God. Want it? And that was it. So that's that's sad. That's really sad. Yeah, I think four did some okay things, but it it was not my least favorite. Three was my least favorite. Four, oh, really? Yeah, yeah. Four. I think it did some good stuff. It, it was alright. Interesting. Um, okay, because like yeah. three, I thought was really um, diverse in a sense because of Heather's character. But yes. I don't know. Th- three just really intrigued me because of the way that they broke the game up in like the way that. I don't know, her mentality is at the time and yes. the way that they did her kind of like alter ego Alessa and everything like that. Because yes. that's a one part that I really enjoyed from 3 was really getting to delve into the character mm-hmm. Alessa because I feel like it should have been 1, 3, 2, and then 4, you know? Yeah, actually, that makes a lot of sense to me. Um, 3 was more like a prequel to 2 most, to me. Yeah, yeah, that makes a lot of sense. And then 4 sure where it's in. It does, I feel like 4 kind of stands apart from the other as like related to Silent Hill story like at the, I, feel, I feel like at the end of 4 you could have been like and that town's name was Silent Hill and everybody would go oh my god like you know <laughs> basically, <laughs> basically. Oh, this is a Silent Hill game what oh what as a side note, I do have to say something. It's one thing I do mention oh, a lot in the playthroughs that I do of where the mention of holes. I know I make <laughs> fun of this constantly, but like every single Silent Hill game I've played, they're like, there's a hole here, but it's gone now. I'm just like, why can't I stop laughing at this? <laughs> I think it's just a running gag that people fit in. We, we certainly had some jokes on our team about like oh another hole the player's gotta stick his hand into <laughs> exactly um, just, the other I'm one just, is toilet um... humor there's always like a filthy toilet you have to like train spotting into or something in the game yeah but it's it's just a running gag we all take it in, in good stride like everybody realizes how corny it is and then, yeah, yeah it has, i was just it like Whenever uh, Silent Hill Homecoming started up and you had to read your hand in to get the, you know, the yeah. stuffed animal for Josh, I yeah. was just like, another hole, really, you guys? Yeah. <laughs> All right, Josh, I'll buy you a new bunny. Come on, get out of here. <laughs> exactly. It's uh, like, oh, what kid wants, like, a bunny rabbit that's filled with blood that was in a carnival? I don't know. Yeah. Not me. <laughs> yeah, the blood, the blood rabbit, yeah. I think um, it was the same rabbit from uh, 3, right? It's the I same think so, yeah. The Wonderland. yeah. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, the one that, uh, what was it, that um, that Heather first saw whenever she entered in her dream state, which I love that they do dream states, by the way, in Silent Hill. They do this thing of where it's like this alternate kind of multiverse theory Mm -hmm. you got going. I was like, okay, I knew it. They're doing a dream state again with Alex. Yeah, you're not sure whether it's like the real real game or not, the real game where you're playing a dream or not playing a dream. Exactly, yeah. It's very neat. I love that. I I think we could have more of that. So now getting into more of like the nitty gritty questions mm-hmm. that I know people are wanna gonna know as the kids say they want they're gonna wanna know the T <laughs> too because because <laughs> any time right. I go into the Silent Hill community or forums or anything there's been a debate 
as far as the inclusion of pyramid head goes. And I know we've talked about this <laughs> on Twitter and everything. Yeah, yeah. And people think that it was fan service. And in your opinion, why was pyramid head put into oh. the game Homecoming? And do you think there's still a place for this character if more games are made in the franchise? Okay. So as we have to preface this with, we start, this is what got us talking on Twitter initially, right? Was the thread on uh, Ito-san's, um, uh, he, he periodically reposts the thread that says, yeah, I was the designer of Pyramid Head. I think, yeah, I think he's very sensitive about the design of Pyramid Head um, as it ties into the Silent Hill universe. And I, I love following him on Twitter. Um, oh, Sam. <laughs> I, I, think, I think he posts really insightful things about the game. And he's, just, he's still really like, uh, occasionally will dredge up a pearl of the development from when they were working on one or two or something. So Pyramid Head is a is problematic because he is the iconic Silent Hill character. I mean, when people say, when people say, what do you associate with Silent Hill? What characters? People go, Pyramid Head! Like, it's the number one. Like, because he's cool, man. He's a big ripped dude with the Great Blade, and he freaking messes people up. And he's scary. I mean, and two, he you're like, what is this guy? I don't know what it is. Like, it's gonna kill me. It's it's raping a nurse. Oh my god! Like this is a messed up character. You want to know more about it, but there also has to be mystery. And Ita-san has said, like Pyramid Head is not just a monster. He he is a very personal creature towards James. He reflects a side of James's psyche. Um, and and then he doesn't want to spill the tea. He doesn't want to spill the tea. He's keeping it close to his chest in a in an insulated thermos, <laughs> right? Um, so. Homecoming, I mean, people say, who are we going to put Homecoming? we got to bring back Pyramid. He's the best. How can we fit Pyramid in the game? Um, and the writers, so we we had a script. I still have a couple of some game developer artifacts. We had a script that we were given that was the entire game written out from start to finish. Um, and what they told us was the game was even in development. They had the full script for it, full gameplay script. that had all the story beats, all the characters, um, and there were... So think some mentions of pyramid head in there pyramid head shows up he does this he does that um and people said is this the same pyramid head that from silent hill that does all these horrible things to james and is james and the official answer i got personally i can't speak for anyone else was no it's not the same pyramid head. that there are multiple pyramid heads and that oh, they wow. are yeah yeah that and and as we see i mean we see this this is canon. there are multiple so there's there's you have to fight two of them in two i think right um and then in one of the endings for silent hill i don't know did you get that one play for I, the, I did i got the boogeyman ending the boogeyman ending okay sweet um so there are three now right alex gets turned into one at the end of homecoming if you get the boogeyman ending um so the question is like where and then that opened a whole bunch more questions it's like wait people are pyramid heads where where did it, you know there's a third one now it's this guy like where did the first two pyramid heads come from? Is that canon? Like, you know, it raised more Is questions. one of the pyramid heads James, potentially? Like, there's right. some unanswered exactly. questions. Exactly. Exactly. Could it be? Right? That, that did, did he? And I like that. So I think it's okay to have pyramid head in a game as long as you're not canon saying pyramid head is a beefy guy. He back in the day. They made him an executioner. He kills people. And that this guy, James, is now a pyramid head, too. James is the pyramid head of lust. Alex is the pyramid head of rage. This guy was the pyramid head of sloth. Blah, blah, blah. Like all, you know, I, I only bring that up because that was the theory that we had. When, you know, oh, okay. People, people said all the pyramid heads represent something. And that this guy. Oh, I, like the seven deadly sins or something. Yeah, like the seven deadly sins. <laughs> and I'm like, see, but that, that to me becomes boring because that's been done a few times, right? The idea that I think, like Ito san said, Pyramid Head is personal for James and that there could be other Pyramid Heads, but that that was his game. His Pyramid Head in Personal 2 was his own personal. And then I think... So that's my official canon answer, is that in Homecoming, I think Pyramid Head is a dark reflection of the powers of Silent Hill and that he was Alex's personal Pyramid Head in that game. And I think his actions match up with it. And when I had input and when other writers that I agreed with had input, um, that was how he was used as a reflection of things that were going on Alex's psyche or his mental problems or what. See, it's, it's interesting that you say that because I, I, I finished writing my review for the game and it's something that I strongly put in connection with um, 
the ego and the super ego because yes. whenever I thought about it, it was one of these things of where like like I said earlier, you know, you if you as long as you don't fear the things that you do research about, then you know it's it's cool. You don't have anything to to fear over. But whenever yeah. I was looking into Pyramid Head, he's basically the part about the person's choice that yeah. they hate the most about themselves. Like they choose to be like that or else they wouldn't become their own personal pyramid head to an yeah. extent. So I yeah. feel like it's it's very good of Ito-san to not give away any secrets because that, that has that mystery and it has that kind of, I, I want to say legacy because I feel yes. like he, that's something that he's going to take with him to his grave. He's not going to tell anybody besides, <laughs> you know, Kojima, you know, or anything <laughs> like that. Right, right, right. <laughs> Absolutely. So, now, yeah. could they make it? Could they put? Yeah, I think you in your question is like, is there still a place for this character in Silent Hill? And I, I think so, but I think it has to be treated with respect, right? You can't just have a, a a game, a part of the game where like you have to fight Pyramid Head and he's summoning up waves of nurses to fight you, and it's like a raid boss <laughs> battle from WoW. I'm like, eh, no, yeah, no, that's just, no. That's so um, silly. That has no place. <laughs> yeah, it's 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 lurking, right? It's 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 cosmic. Um, yeah. It's can't it's kind understand. of like the devil on the shoulder in a way. Yeah, if you think about it. No, it, does that mean that Pyramid Head's always a bad guy? I don't think he's necessarily bad. I don't think he makes it. I don't think he's an evil. I mean, he maybe comes from some dark powers, but um, like you said with the Boogeyman ending, like I mean, he goes and kills people, but it's more punishment, atonement type of thing. He'll exactly. Of Pyramid Head. He's not. He's not a. Uh, he's lawful. Lawful evil, I guess, would be my guess. So, yeah, I mean, yeah. you see that whenever he kills, you know, Alex's father, like he, like right. in my interpretation, that was Alex himself killing off his memory of his father to yes. an extent. Yeah, because I, whenever, like, you know, as I said, you know, when, whenever I see the pyramid head, especially in that ending, like I was freaking out. By the way, whenever I had got mm. that ending, and I was just like, "Wait a second, this yeah. makes perfect sense," and why people yeah. should not say that this is just fan service that no, it was it put into the game for the reason that it is. I'm gonna say I'm not gonna speak for everybody. I'll speak for myself. That was the one I liked the best. I thought it was the best. I'm like, yeah, <laughs> you yeah, messed up, exactly. Alex. <laughs> now you're yeah. trapped in torment forever. Yeah, and excuse my French, but whenever I was playing the game, I told people I was like, you know what? I'm going to be a complete dick in this playthrough. I'm sorry. <laughs> There's one playthrough where I'm like that. There's right. one playthrough where I'm the good guy, and I just want to be able to see what happens if I just kill everybody. Right. Yeah, I just I just want to kill everybody. Yeah. Well, um, and that to me is what makes the boogeyman ending most real to me is because he is a reflection of Alex's psyche. And you look at the whole story is about, um, he comes home and, and he has to figure out why he's so messed up and he has to figure out what the hell is going on in Silent Hill. Um, and he feels bad because he killed his brother. He accidentally, he may have been an accident. There are some people who say it was on purpose, but he right, killed his brother. Yeah. He feels guilt, right? And there's ways of dealing with that. Uh, again, and this is uh, one of the things I like about Silent Hill is it ties into the psyche and your your internal uh, psychology is reflected around you, the psychology of the characters. And with Alex, it's like, does he want to forgive his mom for basically abandoning him to the dad and just letting these horrible things happen? No. But he says, no, I reject empathy. I, I, I choose the path of the monster. So that's the first choice you make for the yeah, and seeing second. like the mom the way she was like on there, it was just mm -hmm. it was one of the more difficult decisions I've ever had to make in a video game because it's yeah. just like you see the mom kind of like in her own internal suffering where the yeah. puzzle that's it like in the other world for the house. Yeah. That had that was my favorite part of the game. Oh, because excellent. you had the part of the mother where you had to figure out all of her suffering and the part with the father where basically like he killed Silent Hill yeah. creatures because he knew all about everything before the kids, before everybody because yeah. there were three families in the yep. town that each had yep. their own sacrifices and then you had the puzzles for josh and alex where uh, i feel like josh was the saddest one because like it whenever you're holding up something to the light it means it's in memoriam too yep. so basically like you're like oh, okay you're saying goodbye to that person i'm just like guys this yeah. is really tripping me out <laughs> so i will tell you okay so this is you want some designer to uh, this is this is the good part of the podcast where we tell you all the crap that happened uh, behind the scenes. Um, so, so okay, so two and nine. Uh, I think mission two and mission nine were three and nine. Uh, was his Alex's house, and originally the house was put in one big level, and it was a huge freaking part because, like I said, back in two thousand and eight, game design was different. We didn't have as much memory work on machines. Um, so I kind of just started, and one of my jams was memory management, and I said, look. 
part of the game, the problem is you go to this house and then, uh, so you would load into the house level and it was both houses on top of each other the entire time. And then you'd go out of the house and do a bunch of other stuff and come back to it later and you'd have to go to the hell mode. So I went up to the technical designer and said, look, um, we got a problem. The problem is that the house and the hell mode house don't fit in the memory at the same time. So here's my proposal. We take the hell mode house, we take the regular house, we split them up into two levels. Um, the part in the game where Alex is talking to his first time, and he gets, or is it not the first time, the second time, in the, in the house, the hell mode. So you go back from, I think it was the cemetery, into the house, you meet the mom, and then right as you do it, the order whacks you over the head and leaves you kind of in the house, right? So you get trapped inside the hell mode house. So uh, my contribution to the project, I guess, was I said, look, what if we make it so when the order whacks him over the head, it fades to black? We unload the old level. We load in the new hell mode level. We play the scene transition, and then you're in the hell mode house. And they were like, oh, that works. So what we do is, so no, so what we do is you, you're in mission two. The order hits you over the head. It unloads mission two. It puts you into mission nine. And then now you're trapped in Alex's hell mode house. Because you never leave the house until you've completed the final puzzle. To, or, so you're there the whole time. So that like tripled the amount of memory we had in the hell house. And the hell mode house used to just be like, uh, you know, just the puzzles, but like a couple of puzzles here. Um, but now that they had all this extra space, they sent, so they had me wire up a lot of it. And then after I left the project, they only had a month or two to clean it up. They went and added more crap to Mission 9 because of the new, like all the extra space. So Mission 9 got actually padded out quite a bit because now we had all the space, right? Um, same with the initial house. It's like now that we had all this house, they could like improve the textures for the walls and the way it looked and add a little bit more content to it and have you come back a couple times to play through. Um, like, uh, I think it was uh, getting the ceremonial knife. You have to use it to unlock that. Or was it the, yeah, well, so that you unlock stuff. And then there's the, um, I think you, the fire axe, I think, is you, you have to chop the planks off the back. You can get it out of the back door. So that was me too. It was like, hey, we've got this extra thing in the house. Why add some more stuff? Uh, the backyard, I think one of it was, you know, we just had more room to add things. So anytime you see like a little bit of extra audio or like a cool element in the house that you play with or something like that, a lot of that got added because uh, oh, we, that's just, so we, cool. you know, we split it up into two levels and now we're like, oh my God, we've got 200 extra meg to deal with. Just add some more. Oh. See, that's that's really cool. I didn't know that. See, guys, this is why <laughs> you get people working in the industry to tell you the real stuff, okay? Yeah. <laughs> but like the, the the branching off from that, there is um, the 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 main question mm -hmm. I think of this casual nerd episode, which is what these uh, things are called, by the way. Nice. I probably should have said that beginning. Um, oh, that's cool. Is is that a few people that I spoke to before I even started playing uh, Silent Hill Homecoming, they said that you won't finish it because it's really hard. And oh. I was I was trying to think to myself, I'm just like, oh, well, okay, now I kind of have to be wrong, <laughs> but okay. Um, and I personally believe that a hard game is a good game, but mm -hmm. were there some of the mechanics made intentionally hard or was that just how they fell into place? Okay. I'm going to turn it around on you. Did you think it was hard? No, I didn't think it was hard. I thought that a lot of it was just uh, over-dramatized by a lot of people I spoke to. And because mm -hmm. I worked at a game company, I'm more likely to understand why a game is made the way it is than right. someone who is typically going at a game just because they want to play it for shits and giggles, you know? Yeah. Make, so make not, to, not to say, by the way, that anything is special of what I do. It's not. It's just I have a lot of patience. <laughs> <laughs> right. <laughs> it, it does... So, Yes, working in games makes you a lot more forgiving because once you know how the sausage is made, um, you're a lot less forgiving of extremely bad sausage, and you're a lot more forgiving of sausage that is slight. That makes sense. right exactly. You're like, oh, I, I see why they did this, or like, okay, I understand, like that was a budget thing they couldn't. Have Sorry, um, but back to the difficulty. So, man, difficulty sucks. Getting difficulty right, I would say no game has its good difficulty until like a month or ship. So. I personally found Silent Hill Homecoming extremely easy when I played it. Like, I, I could kill everything. I had no problems. I think smogs were the only one I had a problem with. And that was before they got tuned to be the way they are now. Because they had a, they had a very short uh, uh, vincibility, I guess, where they, like, you know, they open up and you have to shoot them. Um, that used to be very short. So that was, like, 
it was like half a second, like whew, whew, open, closed it, you're done, you need to shoot. And then the rest of the time it was like, oh my God. So you would have this like smog just walking towards you and you're trying to deal with some other creature and, and you couldn't kill it. And then for like half a second, whew, whew, open, close. And you're like, damn, I missed it. Oh no, but it's still coming towards you. You know, and you're like, oh fuck, I gotta like around it or whatever. Um, so when we did initial play tests on Silent Hill, I sat down on them. Uh, when we did initial play tests, people said, oh, this game is too easy. I said, okay, well, that's weird. <laughs> so, okay, so then we did a second round of play tests, and they said, um, oh, it's too hard. Hey, isn't this guy supposed to be a soldier? He should get some grenades or a machine gun or something. No, oh, good lord. And, and we were like, oh, this is <laughs> not that kind of game. This isn't. It's not like, Call of Duty. No. But we said, okay, we realized like, it's got to get a little better. Um, so the combat designer, I'm not sure if he's on Silent Hill, I gotta look it up. Uh, one of the combat designers, um, let's see if he's on, I'm looking at IMDb to see if he's on. Like, not, damn, it's the same. Um, so one of the combat designers was one of the ones, uh, he was actually never at the time. And, uh, what I was told was that the weapons are all good against different things. So that different weapons are good against different creatures. And as you got more weapons, it unlocks, um, you know, more ability to, like, kill the different creatures. So I think there's a different, there's takedowns for each type of thing. Like, if you have the pipe and you kill this thing, or if you have the, the knife and you kill this other thing. Um, so once you do that, I think that's the big deal. I, I could see a lot of people having problems, like, trying to kill the flying thing with a knife, or trying to kill a smog with, like, the pipe or something like that, like. Maybe right, and the, and I think the only thing that I felt was kind of an annoyance, and it's the only boss battle that I actually had a really <laughs> trouble with, was the sploocher thing. Oh, oh the cephal, cephal, or cephal. Yeah. Oh wait, oh wait, is the pH silent? I didn't know that. Cephalucher. I think it's, I don't know how it was named, but I think it's sepulcher, and I it, it means Sefl like a, a grave or a, a place of resting, like a. Oh place. my god, that makes so yeah. much more sense because I was pronouncing it Splooter. Splooter, it just kind of splooch, doesn't it? It's kind of, no, yeah, because I had such the cocoons yeah, had, or whatever. The, yes, it the had graves, like the yeah. floating uh, sack things that you had to take down before you took down the actual demon itself. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah so good. during that boss battle, I think was the most. Um, I, I wouldn't say annoyed because again, I don't really get annoyed at boss battles, but I've. I, it was yeah, the only that's a difficult hard boss battle. I ever had and the one thing that i kind of noticed in the um not the controls but the way mm -hmm. the character movement was of where each time alex would get um punched down he would stay there for like five seconds and i'm like dude yeah. get up yeah get the stun <laughs> the stun on that was too long because it's supposed to be simple it was like a big heavy tree right it's like a tree boss thing sort of related so i think they said that so each each one is a different element right so that was their I think the earth boss um and it was supposed to be heavy and like if you got punched you were stuck you know you were staying there whatever i think that stun was way too long i agree yeah. Yeah. <laughs> I, I, yeah. I did not i did not particularly like it i mean it feels impactful and bad and to not get hit right yeah but uh yeah i think i think too a little yeah, because like there, there are just certain enemies that whenever he gets knocked out, I feel like Alex is just done with life. He's like, I'm just gonna lay here for a little <laughs> right, day. You know? Right. Just, well, just, you know. but that's the trouble. Like, you know, you, you want to make it feel realistic, right? I mean, if I got punched yeah. by a giant tree, I would. <laughs> so. Uh, that's true. Yeah, but it's a game. It has to be, fun, right? So you have to balance yeah. it. For people say, okay, this is this is hard but fair. Um, I think I think they mostly did that for the game. There was some. BS combat parts where even I got up and I was like, "All right, there's too many guys here. We're like, we gotta, we gotta turn this down." Or like, yeah, that's down. actually something that uh, that I saw in one of the parts where, um, what was it? It was right before you go into the descent of where there were all these nurses in oh, just yeah. one section, and I was yeah. like, "Wait, why were there like five or six nurses all like ganged up around Alex?" I was yeah. like, "Um, what?" <laughs> yeah, there's a there's a lot of them. Yeah, yeah. some of the hospitals, a lot of stuff to fight. Yeah, and I, I just thought it was actually pretty cool in the first scene, and now I'm just kind of branching off because there's one uh, thing that I thought I'd, I'd mention as someone who does, like, research in, like, um, herbology and a lot of stuff like that. Oh, yeah. There was, uh, what was it? I think it was the first accomplishment that you win is Alchemelia's chest or mm -hmm. Alchemelia's shelf or something like that. Mm -hmm. And Alchemelia is a plant to mm -hmm. cure gynecological issues, which I thought was pretty cool because mm -hmm. it relates directly back to the woman and the way that the character um, design was. I'm not going to say in particular because everybody knows the nurse design. 
<laughs> so so right. the way that Alchemelia refers right. back to her, I think it's really interesting the way they have that as an ongoing achievement. So it's like they yeah. have kind of like this female presence constantly because of Alessa in the first few games. Yeah. There's a lot of... Um, I think there should be more uh, women's input in Silent Hill um, because I think some of the female characters are a little... Uh, they're not really written. I don't think anything is necessary to add. Uh, I just think that it is a unique perspective that we explore from Silent Hill. Um, is is the way that the like you know, like you said the nurses. I think I think I know exactly when you shine a night a uh, light. Yeah. 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 Exactly. Yeah. And and then that uh, the sort of lack of agency there, uh, and the way that women are perceived in Silent Hill community. Um, I think it's interesting. So yeah, I think I, if I were to do another Silent I would suggest that we go into a little bit of that and like the different roles that people play, like how the women's role in Silent Hill changes as opposed to uh, the men's role. Um, like the order, I think the order all all male models, uh, but like the head of the, order, or at least one of them is the mayor, right? The you know the woman mayor, and then uh, Alchemia, and you've got these like strong sort of uh, witchy godhead sort of. Uh, characters in it that are you know and like yeah there's a little bit of like sexuality body horror and there always has been a sexual element to silent hill but i think it's it's largely written male perspective so i think having a little bit of female perspective on that would be kind of interesting maybe we'll see a female pyramid head someday (laughs) you know what i can see Alessa (laughs) taking that part actually (laughs) yeah i mean that would be that would be very interesting maybe she could or maybe we could have a silent hill game where you know, Heather is a period of head. <laughs> I don't oh, know. That, that would be you kind know. of trippy. That would be actually kind <laughs> of, that would be a cool DLC, actually. <laughs> yeah, exactly. I think you get the pyramid head costume in game. You can play it in Homecoming if you get the bo- boogeyman in it, right? Yeah, oh my god, I could hide it and I could just be like, hey, I'm one of you. Don't kill me, please. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> it's okay. <laughs> you no, know, just keep it, keep it on the deal. I'm your boss. Let me go. Exactly. Yeah. Be like, hey, Kojima, if you're listening, you got another writer over here if you want one, just saying. <laughs> Kojima. Uh, if, I think if anybody could get sent, he'll made again. It would not be me. Sorry, I don't have enough clout. No, you know what? Honestly, I feel like if there's like enough of a petition going around for people, they would want to see Silent Hill's PT remade. <laughs> I, th- so the thing, I think a lot of people like to see Silent Hill back. Um, as Konami got out of gaming, they really don't do games so much anymore. Don't they do uh, pachinko? They do right? sl- yeah, they do slot machines, which I I'm <laughs> baffled by. I'm like, what are you doing? Because <laughs> it because it makes a lot of money for them. They, um, it's it's low cost to develop things like that, and very high return of investment. As opposed to a video game is very expensive to develop, and you just might not make your. It's just well, it. that's the reality yeah. of it. You know, in the, in the is, casino, the house always wins. Right. Yeah, that's true. Yeah, right. yeah. Unfortunately, in this case, no offense. <laughs> yeah, yeah. yeah that's how it is. But yeah, in, in regards to game development, though, I do. Mm-hmm. My next question is: uh, What was one of the hardest things to tackle <laughs> when working on Homecoming? Because I mean, like, we've talked about a lot of difficult things yeah. in the game. Okay, so this is where we're coming back to the sewer level. So I remember I promised I said we would talk about the sewer level. This is where we're talking about the sewer level. Okay. So there is a gate in the sewer level. It's a two-part gate, and there's a crank on one side, and there's a crank on the other side. And the way it works is, I think you're in the sewers with Ellie? Yeah. And then um, you have to run up to the gate, and you have to crank the gate. And then Ellie ducks under it and goes to the other side and grabs onto the handle, and then she'll crank it for you. And then you walk under the gate, and we both on the other side of the gate you let go of the handle and it closes so it's a, it's a one it's not a one-way gate but it's like it's a gate that takes two people to open and go through this is this was the most annoying thing to code as a level designer because it's like uh like what state is alex in oh he's grabbing the what state is ali in oh she's pathing uh on the net the nav mesh right okay now she's walked over to the gate okay she has to so it, it the game has to know like if I'm Alex and I'm grabbing the handle, send Ellie over to me. Once Ellie is close enough to me, go uh, underneath the, you know, 
go to the gate and then crawl under it, play your animation. And once you're over there, you immediately have to go into the grab the handle position over there and then stay there until Alex either comes under the gate or uh, tries to go away from the gate, at which point you'll run away and you'll start. So like there are all these conditions of like, um, I think there was one part where we had the gate and there was an order guy on the other side of it. So if you were Alex, you would crank the crank, Ellie would go through it, the order would shoot Ellie and knock her out of holding the handle animation. So now Ellie is trapped on the other side of the gate having to fight a bunch of dudes by herself with her like dinky pistol or whatever it is. And like you're just on the other side like, Ellie, I want you to, like help, help, you know, like trying to help her, but you can't because it's a two-way gate and you can't. So it just sucked. So we had to like everywhere they had these gates, we had to take all the enemies out of the way. We had to make sure that they were in the right spot to, to uh, you know, the level wouldn't get unloaded out from under it. We had to code all this special logic for Ellie to make sure that she didn't get stuck in the animations. We had to, like, yeah, and then, like, the animations all had these steps. There was, like, cranking animation, stopped animations, you know, starting cranking animation, like, letting go of the crank animation, getting knocked out of the crank animation, like, all it was like uh, so much involved. Oh, it was so freaking complex. You so want to know something funny though ab first. about that entire level though? Whenever yeah. I, I went through and played that, and I don't, I not to to my own horn, but like if mm -hmm. you want to, there's a playthrough that I did of it um, a lot where you can actually see this glitch that happens per, mm -hmm. when I'm playing it, of where at one point when she's going in, you have Alex cranking the wheel. She mm -hmm. goes over to the other side. I fight mm -hmm. the bunch of needlers, and mm -hmm. then after that, the monster. Comes Comes through. I save mm. the game right after the monster comes through because I wasn't going to take any risks. Uh -huh. And then I come back, but after I come back, I die. And I was like, okay, so good thing I saved my game. Mm -hmm. I reboot back into the game itself. L is there. Yeah. And I'm thinking, why are you here right now? I just saved it after the monster got out yeah. of here. Yeah. And then she follows me and I crank it. I'm like, okay, maybe I just have to trigger the cutscene to happen or whatever it is. And yeah. she goes underneath. There's no needlers. There's nothing. Oh, no. So they <laughs> and I was oh, laughing so much. I was laughing so much because I was like, wait, do I have to like go out of the game in order to go back in and everything? Because I waited for like yeah. a good I think two to three minutes. No need, there's no nothing showed up. Oh, and then no. after I went, uh, I restarted the game, went back, and then uh, it was at the point of where that big monster attacked me, but every time the monster kills me, and I would go back to the save point, Elle would be there again, and no yeah. needlers. Yeah, because it just, it just spawns her there, and then I think that from somewhere. Um, so that was a big thing I did on the game, was uh, there's a lot of clever, what we call portaling. So portaling is like... Um, one section of the game unloads and it's just not there, not getting updated while you're in another section. And you need to be able to like look through the door and see the stuff in the other room or whatever. Um, so coding, some of it was that like there was one bug early on where characters couldn't see through a door, uh, even if it was open. So you would have like a whole room full of needlers or whatever. And then the door would be open and you're just sitting there staring at them and they're just kind of milling around, like not, you know, not recognizing that you're there. And then as, as soon as you put your foot through the door, they're like, hey, what? Oh, there's a guy there. They attack you. <laughs> oh, no. Uh, yeah. I, I feel like there was, there was an interesting bug that always happened whenever he was with L because in the last yeah. part of uh, the playthrough I did, I actually... Um, what was it? I think there were a bunch of order members that came out as soon as the boss battle between Curtis and Alex was done and oh, what yeah. Elle, Elle kept doing she kept walking backwards into a wall I'm like what girl what are you doing yeah she was just trying to she's just trying to retreat from yeah so, yeah yeah uh, and it's like at one point I thought okay so maybe if I like you know uh, move her yeah. character or something like that would work but the way that she ended up following me yeah. was when the scene in order to open up the gate was triggered and she scared the crap <laughs> out of me because when I turned around <laughs> she was right there <laughs> yeah her her ai and curtis is a i'm not curtis uh wheeler's ai were, they're not they're they're not totally not useful but they're they got into trouble more often than not for me so <laughs> um yeah i actually uh now that you mentioned i really like the curtis i thought that was pretty interesting See, I, I, I didn't know, and maybe you can clarify this for me, but I didn't know why he was a boss battle. I thought I compared it to a, a like a father uh, figure mm -hmm. where he was like fighting off kind of like the um the like his father in a way. 
but um, you know i i didn't know if he was like an intentional thing of where he was like fighting off his past or if that was something that was like okay we need like an extra boss here or something like that so everything in everything in silent hill i want to say everything but a lot of elements are inspired by other things and this is some more sweet podcast stuff um so that last layer where you fight curtis the circular saw right um was an homage to texas chainsaw massacre because he's he's kind of like a he's kind of like a, a rednecky guy, you know. There's always the scene in the movie where like there's the dueling chainsaws, and somebody joked, "They're like, well, what if it wasn't a chainsaw? What if it was just a, a circular saw or something?" And people are like, "You know, that's actually a pretty badass weapon." Like somebody else. I mean, sorry, I shouldn't say that. Um, <laughs> you know, okay. you you can really mess somebody up with a circular saw, right? It's like, okay, we'll give Curtis a circular saw. So that was how the circular saw game. Interesting. Okay. Yeah. 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 Oh. Sort of an so arbitrary, the, like, you can't give him a chainsaw, it's too cliche. Like, what else? Uh, what else is a little weapon that you could use in a garage? Uh, yeah, what is one? So. And now, speaking of the characters, though, I do have to ask, what is your favorite character in the franchise, and what character would you like to see more talked about? Because there are a lot of characters that aren't talked about in the Silent Hill series. Um, so that's, it's a little tough, because I would say that my favorite character in Silent Hill is not... Um, I would say is not in it yet. And I guess that makes sense because I would like to see the next Silent Wait, what? Is that, uh, is that you suddenly yeah. giving something away? <laughs> no, 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 no. I, but I meant like, I meant like, um, so I thought, I'm like, uh, you know, everybody says, oh, James is cool. Like, Ellie is cool. Whoever. Um, I don't, I think they're all interesting characters. Uh, I, I like Alex's dad. I think he's actually a very cool character. Um, it, He's he's one of the like the founding members of this town. Uh, I like the idea that all, that that you've got this family and they all know about Silent Hill and that they sort of the only way to appease it is to just periodically sacrifice people to it from from their own family, which is like super right. Um, and his dad, he was so he was the chief of police, right? And he was like ex-military. He was sort of like the military arm, of the the I don't know what his role is. But see, anyway, he's one of the four, like, head honchos. Um, and his thing is, like, he has to kill the son, but then his, his son got accidentally killed, the one that was supposed to get sacrificed, and it messed up his older son, and then he's supposed to be sort of the backup sacrifice. And I think, I think it's a fascinating exercise in the, the family dynamic, the psychology, and I think that's one of the things that helped me got really right. It was like, all these people have to do these terrible things to survive and how it sort of hurts them and, and scars them, messes them up. And then, um, and then the fallout of those actions 18 years later or whatever, now that Alex is an adult and he's come from it. So I think his dad is a fascinating character. Um, and then I think the part in the game where you have to basically like either, uh, you know, just kill him or don't kill him or whatever. I think that's pretty cool. Right. It really is fascinating. It's it's something that I've kind of pondered because whenever I was um, you know, looking at the games, I was I I was kind of try to predict who my favorite character is going to be in a sense. And it's it's between it actually is between Angela from the second game and Pyramid Head. I do like Angela as well. She's a really um and yeah, Pyramid Head, but Pyramid Head's almost not a character. To me, he's more like a force of nature, or a, or a, a. Did you ever see Final Destination? The movie Final Destination. Pyramid Head is like death. In that to me, and that he's he's not necessarily a like I, like I feel like if you kill Pyramid Head, he's just gonna come right back. He he can't die, right? He's not like a, a dude that you can kill. He's like a Jason Freeze, right? He's maybe he's a, a physical form, but he's animated by something darker fucked up um, yeah i mean that's true because he is with every character and protagonist that we've seen not necessarily with heather though he was yeah. the only character that wasn't really with heather heather because he was more of like the protector of alessa to an extent but yes. I, I, yeah. I feel like he was yeah this kind of like force yeah. of nature throughout the game if like the good is the other side of the person then evil would be necessarily pyramid head yes yeah. But I do have to say, this next question is probably going to get a little bit deep, and <laughs> I'm, I don't know how this is going to be t 
taken by a lot of people. So people bear sure. with me on this. Um, but we all know about the infamous Silent Hills PT that got canceled and everything. Mm. I would love to know your thoughts on it being as you worked on one of the games. <laughs> were you face palming? Were you just like, thank the Lord that it's canceled? Or what were your thoughts? So, um, uh, oh, gee. Uh, okay. So first off, we were making Silent Hill Homecoming told that we needed above a certain Metacritic score if you're going to get another Silent Hill game made, uh, especially from the same studio. But they said our target is, uh, I want to say, 85, I think, or 82. Um, I think at, at time of, I just checked the other day, I think it's at 70. Um, so Homecoming did not do as well as they expected, but it wasn't abysmal. Um, they decided not to let us do the next, quote, Silent Hill game after that. They decided to do something else, um, which I'm assuming is PT. Um, I love PT. I played it on a friend's PlayStation. I, unfortunately, wish I did. Um, I thought it was great. I thought it did some neat stuff. It was a very polished sort of uh, vignette called Vertical Slice, which is like a, a fully functioning version of a bigger game. Like, you know, like, like one level, right? It's like a one level. Um, I don't think there was enough in PT. I couldn't project from PT like what the entire game was. Um, but it was great. I, I could see how it was like, it had a lot of potential. Um, it getting cancelled I think was a fallout just a purely politics. I think it's purely just game studio politics. I think it came at a time when I think Konami said, hey, these games just aren't making us enough money, we just need to switch. Um, especially well, you had somebody like Kojima too. Kojima is a rock star, right? He is like, you know, it's like if you had a movie and I don't know, Scarlett Johansson was going to be in it. And people were like, oh, Scarlett Johansson wants 15 million to be in this movie. And then you're, you're looking at the numbers saying, oh my God, like this movie can't even make $8 million. Like we can't pay for ScarJo. We can't even get ScarJo. Like we can't, you know, we can't even make this movie and make money off. It. Like we're probably not going to, like even if we paid $15 million a minute, it would have to get a 99 on Metacritic to be even break even, right? Like, so for them, I think it was just a numbers game. And, that it had nothing to do with like we don't think silent go anywhere etc um, yeah, yeah which i mean like in a way you know i i understand why it was canceled from a logistical standpoint i mean you know they just couldn't uh you know yeah. realistically have the numbers to back yeah. everything up while it was beautiful and while the engine work the way that they did everything absolutely stunning and the fact yeah. that like you had these different points of where like it was the first time in a video game where i legitimately felt scared and i don't oh, normally yeah. feel scared during video games oh, yeah. so whenever i saw people play because i don't i'm an xbox person i don't have a ps4 yet yeah, um <laughs> i i actually xbox like, crew remember, yeah Exactly. People, was, oh, they get so mean at us for liking Xbox. I don't get it, but that's another story for another time. <laughs> and anytime that I would see people play through uh, the game, I would be thinking without, you know, really kind of conscientizing in a sense, because I was going from an emotional standpoint of like, oh, why did it have to be canceled? But when you think about it, it could be good as a standalone DLC. So you said good, bad, needed. So needed, no. I'm sure they could have just continued Silent Games. Um, I feel like there was no no corporate idea for making it a franchise. So, you know, they came out with all these different games, but they weren't, it wasn't like a consistent story between them. It wasn't, uh, I get the impression there wasn't a shared Bible for Silent Hill. People knew Pyramid Head's like this, or these people are like this, or here's how they all tie together, you know, the crazy board with red strings on it. Um, so I feel like... Uh, if we continued to get good Silent Hill games, no complaints. Um, I'm glad that they paused it rather than putting out bad games that didn't fill the vision of the series. So if they were going to do it, I'd want them to do it right. I want them to really have the Silent Hill feel. Um, but I, I, I think it's a tough feel to get right. Because I think there's, there's, you know, people say, oh, I want the combat to be better. So we got some combat improvements at Homecoming. But then people said, oh, it feels too much like an action game. Right. Or you can make the graphics better, but you know, how do we want it to look? Part of the charm of the originals is the kind of kind of blocky retro graphics and sort of the dream feel to it. So um I, I think if we were to do another Silent Hill game, it would have to be very carefully thought out, um, and with respect to the original series and again tying back to 
on period right head um you know it has to match it has to match the respect for the character with the quality of with the quality of the game if konami were to come back tomorrow and say hey we want to make another silent hill game it's not going to be pt but it's going to be cool uh and and it's going to be awesome and here it's silent hill and look at all these monsters you kill and stuff sure but it's not it's not necessarily a silent hill game right so of well possibly a silent hill game is being made here and there and uh kojima is uh you nah. know partnering with different people and i'm just like <laughs> if it's going to be really something of silent hill he would not be blasting it all over the place like he is he would be working in silence up till the very last minute <laughs> yeah I, I think he would not he seems pretty close man so it's very very clever <laughs> very smart yeah and, and that's the thing of where like um what was it what even one of my family members was like you know if you were if i were to write a story for silent hill what would mm -hmm. it look like and it's one of the things of where like you have to be very careful about like even if indie developers were to go in and create something completely new it's like i can't just go in and be like oh, okay you know you have different things here and there yeah. and then you say here a minute like you have to be very careful about like how you go about the story to make yeah. sure that follows the plot line even with number four right <laughs> that right. way it follows the plot line yeah. but i mean it's okay to say like we're gonna make a game hide in the silent some of the characters will appear um but then it's not set in silent hill or it's not primarily about silent hill it could be about another story that ties into it or it could be a story about how you know like four a little bit or, or like three um you know how the character finds a way into Silent Hill somehow. That's part of their story. It's not necessarily like it doesn't have anything to do with Alessa, Cult of Faltiel, or whatever. Right, and that's yeah. the same thing that was actually done with Homecoming. Like, you know, it was Alex's story. It was based around mm -hmm. the concept of Silent Hill, but it was its own kind of like separate thing to an extent. Yeah. But it still had that tie-in, which is why I'm mm -hmm. so surprised it got the rating that it did. <laughs> yeah, well, I, I think people expected a little something different. But um, I think. See, uh, this is the dark thing. It's like, you know, uh, did you ever see the Yahtzee interview? Yahtzee, Ben Croshaw. Uh, so if you get a chance and podcast people can look it up. So there was um, Zero Punctuation. Which is, yeah, he's a famous uh, game reviewer or whatnot. Back in the day, before Silent Hill Homecoming came out, he announced, oh, there's going to be a Silent Hill game. And he said in the interview, uh, if this Silent Hill game is any good, three of my vertebrae bend over backwards and eat my own ass and we had this written up on a quote on the the board um in the level design room where we used to hold our meetings and we said okay guys what are we gonna do today to make ass um and, and that was sort of our motivation for it right which is like okay we got it we got to do this like we're, we're gonna make the best game ever and then he's gonna have to review it and, he's, and and we're gonna have to get him on this one right so he so the game came out, and we were all sitting around. We're like, yeah, oh, we can't wait to see what Yahtzee says about it. And then he released the review of Silent Hill Homecoming. So if you go review it, uh, I think it was pretty fair overall. But what he said was, um, I remember, uh, he called out, he said, oh, I remember, I said I would do this thing, uh, but I'm going to cop out and say, no, I'm not going to, because this isn't a, actually, quote, a Silent Hill game. He said, it feels like Silent Hill, it looks Ooh. like Silent Hill, it plays like Silent Hill, but it's not really a Silent Hill game. And I was like, <laughs> man, Yahtzee, you freaking dude, come on. So, uh, yeah, he, he cheated. I was like, look, either it's a Silent Hill game or but like... <sighs> The thing is, is that it's one of, and I'm going to go out on a limb and say this because I'm going to say it with my whole chest, that sure. Homecoming is one of the best Silent Hill games I've Aww. ever played personally. And I'm not just saying that because I'm interviewing you or anything like that. I'm, I'm genuinely, like, really <laughs> saying that because any, like, what yeah. sold me was the uh, level whenever Alex was mm. experiencing, uh, experiencing his home as hell. Like, that's what sold me on it. Oh, yeah. Because if you can tie back the family roots of the game to Valtiel, mm -hmm. to uh, Silent Hill, to, you know, mm -hmm. Pyramid Head, to everything that's messed up in his life, and you can tie everything into the story, that's right. what makes a good Silent Hill game. Because it's completely subjective to the user. Like, yeah. you could you could be your own personal Pyramid Head. You could be your own Alessa. Yeah. You could be your own Heather or James. Yeah. And that's why, like, if anybody who's listening gets a chance to play Silent Hill Homecoming, yeah. get it all backwards compatible because it is definitely worth the play. Yeah. yeah. 
wholeheartedly believe that. And it's awesome. one of those things of where I will say again, Pyramid Head was not fan service, you dingle dogs. <laughs> yeah. <So. laughs> we, we tried really hard not to make him. Um, and that's another story. So we actually changed uh, game directors, I think, right at the beginning, producers or something. So he was uh, one of the art department guys. And he basically, the initial person said, we want like a level where you know Alex is walking down the street and like nurses are jumping out of the windows and attacking him. And everybody's oh, like, no, 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 it's not really Silent Hill, bro. No, can't do it. So he's like, okay, well, what about a level where like you're being chased by a pyramid head and, and you're like trying to run through this hallway and he's like behind you and he's like coming after you. You just have to like jump over all these things and like away. And we were like, no, that's kind of more action-y too. That's not really like what we're thinking of, you know. There were there were management issues I wasn't privy to, but he left and we got a different who did not want to abuse Pyramid Head or the nurses. And... This is where the writers always have control. This right. is why we're awesome. Okay, no. <laughs> yeah, yeah. No, you, you need <laughs> because the thing is, is that if you mess with the story, it's like, I don't, okay, I can't imagine a fiercer mm-hmm. combat in real life than if you mess with a writer's story, honestly. <laughs> yeah, they, they were very different. Um, but the writers team, they all worked well. Uh, and there was input from Konami, but I don't think too much. So I, uh, they were very heavy-handed about the production of the game, but not necessarily about the game itself, um, if, that makes, if that makes sense. Um, so I think it was a nice delineation. So they, they did a pretty good balance of it. Okay. Now, I do have to say we are getting close to the end of the podcast, but I do have one more question for you before we end things off, and that is mm-hmm. about homecoming are there any well i should actually rephrase this what are mm-hmm. the parts about silent hill homecoming or actually any silent hill game that you like the least um so i know I was, we're ending on an interesting no, one Sorry, i know guys. That, that's a really interesting one <laughs> um so homecoming uh i think it was a little predictable in some ways and it's hard for me to fairly say that obviously you know I, I was privy to the script from day one so I knew what everything was going to be and whatnot. Um, but I, I feel like a little bit of it was like once you've gotten enough of the puzzle pieces you much figure out um, I think it's okay I think a certain level of player knowing what's going on and then the, the character not knowing on what's going on is acceptable um, I think in Homecoming they did an all right job of it because you can say you can say, "Oh my God, I've read all these clues, I've looked at these notes, I've you know listened to all these audio diaries." It's very clear that you know this is this is how the town is set up, this is how the game is set up, this is what's going on, you know. Um, so I, I think it it in that this, the characters can't be clueless, right? I think that's part of it, and I, that really annoys me a little bit about some of the first games. I don't know if you've seen the meme from the first game with. You know, there's a dog house, but no dog. Oh, here. yeah, yeah, <laughs> the, exactly. The dog it's... is coming at him from behind. Um, <laughs> it's like the know, dog is here, but it's gone now. Right. So there's there's a little bit of like the, the campy sort of cluelessness that goes on in Silent Hill. Uh, you know, like people reaching their yeah. hand into a dark hole to get out of stuff. <laughs> like, I wouldn't do that. You put a stick in there or something, right? It makes a little sense. Um, so there's that. And then the absolute thing I like the least about any Silent Hill is I think in the second game, there's a puzzle where you have to put juice on trash in a trash yes. chute to make the juice go down. And what was that? I remember I got so infuriated by that puzzle because I think that puzzle is gated by you doing something else. Because exactly. I remember yeah. the first time I played it, I went, oh, obviously I have to put the heavy juice on the garbage to make it go down. And I tried it and it's like, you can't do that yet. I'm like, so I go somewhere else to do some stuff and I come back and you try to put the juice garbage and it works that time. And you're like, wait a minute, hold on. Like, I just did that and you said I couldn't do it, but now you're letting me do this? Like, It's completely wait, counterintuitive. <laughs> what's going on here? And why don't I just poke the garbage like with a stick? Or Exactly. You, you know, so, and that's my rule is like for bad puzzle design is if I couldn't solve this with a stick then it needs to be re- re- it's like if i just had a stick i could push that lever over there and this would work like this puzzle needs to be redesigned you know using at least... that in future playthroughs if i have yeah. a stick it's bad. <laughs> yeah. yeah it's like man if only i had a stick i could solve this puzzle like and that that because you could walk around anywhere in your house and find a brick that you could use to solve a puzzle if you know like, or or a metal pole or 
anything, a piece of rebar. It doesn't it, like Alex has a pipe. Why couldn't you just jam the pipe in there and pry that thing open? Like that would that would work just fine, right? So that to me is, um, but that's more of a generic puzzle games in general. So it doesn't necessarily apply to Silent Hill. That is what I like about Silent. Hill. Some of the nonsense. Why I mean, it, it's, 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 it's oh my it's god. Fair, though. Yes. It's fair because you know when whenever you have something that you can easily do by just a chain reaction of something else, then it's yeah. justified. Because like there are several games in which I think, oh god, the production quality is just so bad. And and one thing actually, a fun fact for those of you who are listening who did not know that dreamlike airy sequence that's the fog for Silent Hill is actually a loading mechanism for the screen. Yeah. So those <laughs> of you who who didn't know that it's a rendering process, well, mm-hmm. that's the fog. That's what they used to render back in the day. The more so, you know. <laughs> so we had a on the fog note, we had a fun. Um, it's the last fun Silent Hill homecoming fact during the production of the game. At one point, there were huge fires in Orange County was made uh and a lot of basically smoke and ash were falling during the production of the game just oh like in gosh. silent hill one <laughs> there are times where um and i think we worked through october as well so we would come out of the building for a you know break or whatever we'd be standing outside and it looked just like we were in silent hill there was there was smoke and stuff from the fires. There was ash raining down. Everything smelled like fire. Um, fire got close. It was like you could actually see the red glow in the sky sort of away from it. Um, and we were all very much freaked out that it was art, life imitating art, as it were. You know? That is crazy. Yeah, it, it was wow. pretty ridiculous. Um, and then the same with October. So October came around and people were like, oh, it's Halloween. So we decorated the office a little bit. Like uh, There's some Silent Hill stuff around. Uh, one of the character animators went as a nurse um so she had the full outfit dressed up and painted uh you know and everything so that was um really messed up to come into work and then see an actual nurse from Silent Hill <laughs> walking around in the office uh so she played all day she would like sneak up behind people where they were working and just stand there and then like yeah tap their shoulder and they turn around and see a real nurse from Silent Hill um, it's like peekaboo. Yeah, exactly. It's pretty amazing. She, uh, I kind of want this. I kind of want to see like a female interpretation of the pyramid head. To be honest. <laughs> yeah, that would be. I think that's the real takeaway from this pod. So, Kojima, if you're listening, please hire. We'll make a pyramid head. female pyramid head. Let's do it. <laughs> Let's go. <laughs> That'd be great. That'd be great. I'm sure the fans will come up with some cool nickname for. It. No, because then, yeah. then you'll get the overly political correct feminists so they'll just come at it uh, and just rip it apart i'm just yeah. like or know vice what? versa the the anti-feminists who are like, you can't pyramid head can't be a woman it's like i don't ma- it doesn't matter if you wear a skirt or pants i just want to get the story right <laughs> well he does he does wear a skirt he wears like a loincloth right he i don't i didn't play the first game so i don't know he well i don't think he's in the first one the second one he's he wears like a loincloth Oh, I it's thought you like were talking a, about the, the the character for the uh, for Santo Homecoming, the not a Homecoming, the first game for the father. I was oh about no, that guy. No, no. <laughs> no, no! I'm at, I'm at Pyramid Head. He wears oh, okay. sort of like a, a utility kilt, sort of. Utility. I've never heard the word used like that. Utility kilt. Yeah, it's it's like a it's like a like a manly branded uh, kilt. They're like made out of. Okay, that makes uh, actually sounds a lot better though. When instead of saying a skirt, <laughs> yeah, yeah, no, I don't know what it is. it's like a like a gray sort of, really like loin loincloth or whatever. So. A loincloth. Tarzan is jealous. <laughs> Tarzan of the. <laughs> <laughs> but I do have to say, thank you so much for being on the podcast. You, you guys, I do highly, highly implore you, if you have not, again, played Silent Hill Homecoming or played any of the Silent Hill games, please do so. They are a trip, <laughs> most definitely. Uh, you Excellent. will definitely experience a lot of things and you will come away from it either incredibly disturbed or incredibly educated. That is completely up to you. So, um, But yes, if you do not already follow Justin, be, please be sure to follow him down the description below and his twitter he does post uh, a lot of interesting stuff i will say because it's either about gaming or washing your hands <laughs> <No>. <laughs> but if you guys like my face and what i do please be sure to subscribe and hit that bell down below because i make videos every monday wednesday and double uploads on friday so stay casually nerdy and i'll see you all in the next video thank you so much for joining me again justin it was a pleasure having you no problem it was wonderful thank you Ariane. all right peace you guys
Thank you.